Hello, everyone out there on YouTube, on Zoom. Welcome to Afternoon at the Museum with Ira. I'm Janine Stanley. I am our Director of Customer Communications. And behind the scenes, we have a new friend. We have Ira Tech Corp, who's our robot, who has set up all of our automation. Uh, you know, it's really Ryan Bishop, but don't tell anybody. And today we have with us our host, Stephanie Watts. Hi, Stephanie. Hi, Janine. How are you? Hi, I'm, everyone. I'm good. And Agent Julia. Hello, Julia. Hello, everyone. We Hi, are very excited to start Black History Month with a show every Friday this month. And we're going to start by going on a trip to the Wild West. Stephanie and I were thinking, what can we look at and talk about that's kind of different, kind of unique? And we came upon something that I will turn the show over to Stephanie to talk about. And then at the end of the show, we'll go over what else we have planned for the rest of the month. Well, thank you, Janine. And um, Julia, just let me know if my voice drops a little bit. I'm um, dealing with a little issue over here, <coughs> excuse me, with throat and ear. So um, hopefully I'm okay. I sound okay um, to everyone. And Janine, you let me know as well. Um, today we are visiting the Buffalo Soldier Museum and um, I'm without notes, so in my winging it, I don't remember where they're located. Julia, do you have that information? Houston, Texas. Houston, right, Houston, Texas. And um, so we hope to have a entertaining hour or so show um, visiting this museum. Um, I know as a kid growing up, I would hear about Buffalo soldiers and I, I just kind of thought, well, how can a buffalo be a soldier? That was where I was at eight or 10 years old. And as I got older and you realize, oh, it's associated with African-Americans. And, but I, I still didn't quite know and honestly don't know all the story and history, but it is a museum that is rich with a lot of history. So uh, Julia, where, where are we? Are we Let me go the... ahead and share so everybody can see what we're looking at here. Mm -hmm. All right, so the Buffalo Soldier Museum is located at buffalosoldiermuseum.com and the physical museum is located in Houston, Texas on Caroline Street, right downtown. And let's see, on the website, I think a good place to start would be a section they have called, Who Are the Buffalo Soldiers? Perfect. Let, let's do it. And, and by the way, before you start, does mm -hmm. this museum also offer the 360 view that, that's become very popular um, these days? I have not run into any 360s on this website. Um, there are a couple little videos and there are some photos of exhibits. The website itself, however, is very text-based. So we'll probably do quite mm -hmm. a bit of reading today. And I would okay. say if we come across anything in the reading that you want description of, perhaps we could Google and find photos. Sure. Like and then that. they also do offer virtual field trips that you have to sign up for, but those would probably be where you get more of the 360 type stuff if you wanted to do mm -hmm. this online independently. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. So let's well, start with the Who Are the Buffalo Soldiers page. And the beginning of this section is called The Beginning. It says, African-Americans have served proudly in every great American war. In 1866, through an act of Congress, legislation was adopted to create six all-African all all American <laughs> Army units. The units were identified as the 9th and 10th Cavalry, Cavalry and the 38th, 39th, 40th, and 41st Infantry Regiments. The four infantry regiments were later recognized to form the 24th and 25th Infantry Regiments. These fighting men represented the first black professional soldiers in a peacetime army. The recruits came from varied backgrounds, including former slaves and veterans from service in the Civil War. And the next section is called Origins of the Nickname. African Americans have served proudly in every great American war. And that's what we just read. Let's skip over this particular section. Let's see. African Americans have fought in military conflicts since colonial days. 
However, the Buffalo soldiers comprised the former slaves, freemen, and black Civil War soldiers were the first to serve during peacetime. Once the westward movement had begun, prominent among those blazing treacherous trails of the Wild West were the Buffalo soldiers of the U.S. Army. These African Americans were charged with and responsible for escorting settlers, cattle herds, and railroad crews. The 9th and 10th Cavalry Regiments also conducted campaigns against American Indian tribes on a western frontier that extended from Montana in the northwest to Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona in the southwest. Throughout the era of the Indian Wars, approximately 20% of the U.S. Cavalry troopers were Black, and they fought over 177 engagements. The combat prowess, bravery, tenaciousness, and looks on the battlefield inspired the Indians to call them Buffalo Soldiers. The name symbolized the Native Americans' respect for Buffalo Soldiers' bravery and valor. Buffalo Soldiers, down through the years, have worn the name with pride. Buffalo Soldiers participated in many other military campaigns. The Spanish-American War, the Philippine Insurrection, the Mexican Expedition, World War I, World War II, and the Korean Police Action. Much has changed since the days of the Buffalo Soldiers, including the integration of all military servicemen and women. However, the story of the Buffalo Soldiers remains one of unsurpassed courage and patriotism and will forever be a significant part of the history of America. African Americans have fought with distinction in all of this country's military engagements. However, some of their most notable contributions and sacrifices came during the Civil War. During that conflict, more than 180,000 African Americans wore the Union Army Blue. Another 30,000 served in the Navy and 200,000 served as workers on labor, engineering, hospital, and other military support projects. More than 33,000 of these gallant soldiers gave their lives for the sake of freedom and their country. Shortly after the Civil War, Congress authorized the formation of the 9th and 10th Cavalry in the 38th, 39th, 40th, and 41st Infantry Regiments, six all-Black peacetime units. Later, the four infantry regiments were merged into the 24th and 25th Infantry. In Infantries. In countless skirmishes and firefights, the troopers won the respect of the Plains Warriors who named them Buffalo Soldiers. African Americans accepted the badge of honor and wore it proudly. And at least 18 medals of honor were presented to Buffalo Soldiers during the Western campaigns. Similarly, 23 African Americans received the nation's highest military award during the Civil War. So that's kind of the intro that they have here about where the name comes from and what regiments. So they didn't have any particular uniforms. They just wore the regular military uniforms. There's Um, a little bit of information here about the various different uh, regiments and cavalries. Yeah, and I wonder if there's any kind of um, pictures of what they look like and or what you know, what, um, like I said, uniforms or anything. They, yeah, I, th- uh, I think we can locate that. Um, down below here, they have information about the 24th, 25th um, regiments, and then the 9th Cavalry and the 10th Cavalry. And in these sections, they have a little bit of history and some information about what they wore. But we could also go ahead and give it a Google, and I could give you some descriptions of what they look like as well, if you'd like. Okay, yes. That would be great. I was wondering, since the military are all about you know, patches, um, if they had a special patch for those units. So mm-hmm. we'll, we'll find out soon. Mm-hmm. Let's start on this page that we're already on, actually. And the first thing is the 24th and 25th Infantry Regiments. And it's funny you should mention patches because the first thing they have here is a patch. And this patch for these Infantry Regiments is a yellow shield-shaped patch with two, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, eight point blue stars on the upper left and upper right side of that shield, and then an upward pointing arrow of blue on the bottom third, like cutting off the bottom third of that shield shape. And let me see if I can find some uniform information about those infantry units. So 24th and 25th. And I wonder, and just out of curiosity, I mean, are buttons on these uniforms special in any way, depending on your rank? Um, do they have any kind of engraving or anything like that? Um, because Janine, you mentioned patches, and so it, you know, it occurred to me to wonder about uh, just literally the look of the buttons. 
Yeah, I, I was kind of wondering about that myself. And I'm going to be curious to see, because the legend that I always heard, I like this story much better on the museum website, as to the actual origin of the name, because a popular, probably, misconception about the name was that they were called Buffalo Soldiers because of the African-American hair. And mm -hmm. that was somehow thought to be like the hair on a buffalo. And I thought, no, not even. Yeah, I guess you, you want to hope that wasn't. I, I would hope that no wasn't, wasn't true. However, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, right. I it, somehow it was one of those. Oh, please let me hear a different version of that. And yeah. sure enough, um, yeah. this is probably closer to the truth. <laughs> This is well. This, right. this is what they said the truth was. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah. No. This is that's great. But um, you know, the Native Americans then gave them that um, honor. You know, mm -hmm. the buffalo oh, yeah. is important. You know, in their culture. So. Oh yeah. I, about Absolutely. respect uh -huh. for the soldiers and how they fought against them. Um, I found a photograph from 1900 of officers of the 24th Infantry Regiment. Mm -hmm. And this is four rows of African-American soldiers and they're wearing, uh, I don't know exactly what color. Let me see what it says on this page, let's see. I'm not sure exactly, but they're wearing darker colored uh, infantry officer jackets that are buttoned up at the neck and buttoned down with what looks like brass buttons from their neck to their uh, waistline. And then they have lighter colored slacks on and polished up boots and officer's hats with a circular part on top of their head and the brim. And you can yeah. see that they have patches on those inverted V-shaped patches on their arms, their upper arms on both sides and stripes around the cuffs of their shirts. And so I guess this is the officer uniform is very uh, polished and put together looking. And then mm -hmm. I also found images of what looks like more the, uh, uh, you know, like ragtag line troops from uh, Civil War era of that same 24th United States Infantry. Mm -hmm. And they have dusty boots up to their knees and sort of like dirty worn pants with stripes up the side and long sleeve heavy coats with brass buttons. And again, that inverted V patches on their shoulders, but rather than officer caps, they're wearing these sort of almost like cowboy hats with wide brims and tall tops mm -hmm. and little dimple in the top of them. And they're all dusty. And it looks like those are meant more for, you know, actually going out and riding and fighting and keeping the mm -hmm. sun out of their eyes. And they're all mm -hmm. marching in a two line formation and they have very old, some of them it looks like are carrying swords and some of it looks like are carrying very old guns like muskets okay. perhaps mm. yeah i'm pretty sure the u.s cavalry carried swords for quite a while yeah they, the mm. officers are carrying swords for sure and a lot mm -hmm. of them have swords over their shoulders and these are of that course so all cool. old black and white photographs without mm -hmm. too much detail mm -hmm. i actually just found a colorized one that's pretty cool mm -hmm. it looks like from this photograph this is a texas regimen I think this might be a bit later, but they have khaki colored pants and shirts on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't realize they carried swords. Um, so we were dueling, I guess, with swords. <laughs> Back I then. Hmm? Well, the cavalry was partially symbolic. I don't know, let's see if we can yeah. find anything else about that. There's Here's cavalry information on here, and this one actually has Ooh. how they got their name and how they dress. So let's take a look oh, at this one. Awesome. Okay. okay, so this is the ninth cavalry back on the Buffalo Soldier Museum site. And they have a really interesting patch for this one. It's a yellow image of a Native American in a headdress riding a yellow horse and carrying a bow and arrow. And it looks like he's riding full speed. The horse's legs are up in the air and there's a lot of like action conveyed by the pose of the horse and of the rider. Mm -hmm. And this patch is outlined by, <clears throat> excuse me, outlined by red and yellow <laughs> outlines. And it's in the shape of it's almost like a little house, like the shape of a house with a wider part of the bottom that says Ninth Cavalry across the bottom. Mm. It's not really any like pure geometric shape. It's a little bit more abstract looking. Mm -hmm. And for this one, this is again, the Ninth Cavalry. And it says how they got their name. And this is more going back to the Buffalo Soldier's name. It looks like a little bit of different information though. It says stories relating to the origin of the legendary name Buffalo Soldiers are as varied as there are people to tell them. 
Presented here are a few of the most accepted ideas regarding the name. Some attribute it to the Indians likening the, cor the short curly hair of the black troopers to that of the buffalo. Another possibility for the nickname was the heavy buffalo robes the soldiers wore on winter campaigns. Others say that when the American bison was wounded, what the American bison rather was wounded or cornered, it fought ferociously, displaying uncommon stamina and courage, identical to the black men in battle. Mm -hmm. and the motto of the Ninth Cavalry is, or was, "We can, we will." Their adversary, whether Indians, outlaws, Mexican revolutionaries, or gun smugglers, found that the Buffalo soldiers, like their namesake, could not easily be diverted from their trail. Whatever the reason for the name, the Buffalo soldier has come down in American military history as one of the proudest individuals of all. During the 1870s to 80s, the Buffalo soldier wore a flannel shirt and a blouse of dark blue with light blue trousers, tucked into over the knee boots. Also, a Civil War kepi, which is the hat, adorned with cross sabers bearing regimental and troop designation. He was armed with a 4570 Springfield carbine rifle, a Cold Army 45, an 1873 model, caliber pistol, and a saber. So the sabers are what we were I was seeing with mm -hmm. them over their shoulders there. He was outfitted with a slouch campaign hat, black at first, and a light grayish brown by 1874. The mm -hmm. Buffalo soldiers were not issued a neckerchief, but generally wore one of his own color of choice anyway, sometimes yellow, more often red or white. These were real necessities, especially for the men riding further back in the column, needing protection from the thick clouds of dust kicked up by the front ranks. Mm -hmm. So it looks like the outfits in those photos were actually blue when they're colorized. Mm -hmm. And Julia, can you find us a, a picture uh, and a description of the saber and the sword? That, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. We are all about the sword. <laughs> all about the sword. <laughs> all about the sword. Well, that's a, that's the joke about the Marine Corps is the coolest branch of the military because they still have swords in their formal oh. dress uniforms for the officers. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So all you Marines out there. Yay. <laughs> But yeah. these guys also had to be really extraordinary horsemen, too, um, as did I most of the soldiers, you know, it, dealing mm -hmm. with things in the West. You really had to, you know, be a good rider and a good, um, you know, husband to your horse. No, that's right. not what I meant, but you know what I meant. <laughs> <laughs> you had to have good animal husbandry skills to keep that, right. uh, that horse alive with you. Well, when you think about being one of the soldiers in the middle or back of the line and you're on the horse and you're getting dust, so of course oh, they're getting yeah. dust too. And just the whole, oh, yeah. you know, the, the, um, the ordeal of what they've gone through and they're not even in battle yet. They're just moving mm -hmm. from one place to another. Um, Lots of chasing, just, uh, chasing, yeah. chasing a, ne'er do wells oh. around. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, doing things, and yet we had segregation even there. And, mm -hmm. um, Isn't that know, amazing? That, I mean, it's just, yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's what we're doing. And yet we wonder, you know, in the, in the thick of battle out there in the West, you know, when it's basically you and your military people, mm -hmm. and, and is there you know, is it the same as the formal setup for the whole, uh, the cavalry and everything? Yeah, we're going to give you a regiment all your own, and you guys go over here and do your thing, and then we're going to do our mm -hmm. thing. But when mm -hmm. it comes down to it, soldiers protect soldiers, exactly. hopefully. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I would well, hope. I've, I'm hoping I'm ascribing some, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, when it comes down to it. Credibility. Yeah. 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 But and, this uh, is such a, I mean, it's such a, an iconic tradition in, in, in the military and starting, you know, to show people that, hey, you know, African-Americans have fought in every war this country has had for this mm -hmm. country. But mm -hmm. these regiments really went out there to actually help, I guess, civilize the West. And it's kind mm -hmm. of interesting that that whole juxtaposition between them and the Native Americans and mm -hmm. and they were actually more friendly than it might seem. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So interesting stuff. Yeah, hopefully we can get into some more information about that whole like Western expansion part of it Ooh, yeah. later. Mm -hmm. um, I found some information about this saber. 
Ooh. Okay. So this is the model 1860 Sabre is the one we would have seen in those pictures, which replaced the 1840 model. Mm -hmm. And it is a long sword made of steel and brass used by the U.S. Cavalry from the American Civil War until the end of the Indian Wars. And some were even still in use during the Spanish-American War. It was 41 inches long with a 35 by one inch blade. It weighed two pounds or three pounds Whoa. with Ooh. its iron scabbard. So it is not actually a light sword. Whoa, no, it's no. not. No, no. <laughs> and it looks like 300,000 of them had been produced by the end of the Civil War by companies like Ames, Roby, and many more by Tiffany and Company. Oh, which is a Tiffany sword. Whoa. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a photo here of the 1860 saber. It's actually a very sort of beautiful, delicate looking weapon, but Ooh. it has a long, like gently curved brass blade or brass and color blade. And gently curved. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> it has you can see a groove going down the center of it, probably to drain liquids and mm -hmm. then the handle is quite intricate looking. It has some lines going across the part where your fingers actually grip and then a brass, um, what's it called? The part that guards your hand from slipping off of it. Oh, the cross guard. Yep. Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. <laughs> and that part is, it has like this sort of pretty four strand, uh, sort of curvy, almost floral looking design to it. So it's actually quite a beautiful weapon. And then it has a, a scabbard that is made of solid, metal and that it has two rings on it I suppose to hang from mm -hmm. a saddle mm -hmm. or something like that yep. when they're traveling. Mm -hmm. And Julia are you able to screen share that particular picture or is that on not it? It's all being shared in the oh, okay. Zoom. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that one. That. We, uh, yeah, yeah everything so on my screen is being some. <laughs> No, I just, I just wondered because mm -hmm. that's something, you know, for those who can see, I, I think that's yeah. really interesting to, to see that. So, well, uh, okay. So we've been introduced to the Buffalo Soldiers. We know a little bit about their history and the creation of the infantry and all of that. Um, what do we have next? Are we um, moving right. in through different uh, yeah and... let's see what else mm -hmm. we have here let's see okay so the visit us section does have an exhibits tab Ooh. okay all right that said i don't think you can actually click into the exhibits i think this is more of an expose of what is there when you visit in person uh -huh. but mm -hmm. each of the exhibits has a little tab where you can see a bit of the artifacts that they have in that exhibit. Okay. Oh, so I can great. do some descriptions of those yeah. things if you'd like. That'd be great. Yeah, let's take a look. Okay, so it looks like the first exhibit they have going on is the Civil War exhibit. And it says that it is showcasing the Emancipation Proclamation. And this mm -hmm. exhibit features photos and weaponry depicting life for the African-American soldiers during the Civil War period. And so what I can see from the photo here that they have for the Civil War exhibit is some photographs. Um, the first appears to be a photo of Frederick Douglass and he is seated in later stages of his life with gray hair and a gray beard. And it is overlaid with a photo of African-American soldiers, which makes me wonder if there's a connection between Frederick Douglass and the Buffalo Soldiers. Mm. Have you guys ever heard anything about that? No, I haven't. Let's bookmark that to look up in just a moment. And then, um, there is a Civil War era rifle in this photograph. It's a wooden rifle with metal uh, stock pieces and a metal trigger. And then there appears to be a couple of different brass busts of different characters from this period. And then also I can see that there's a handful of black and white illustrated articles probably from that period in this exhibit as well. And that's all I can really make out from this photograph. And do you want me to um, Google Frederick Douglass Buffalo Soldiers and see if anything comes yeah, up? Yeah, let's see. That would be interesting. That's just, that's interesting that that was overlaid with Buffalo Soldiers. Yeah, I like that picture. iconography. Mm -hmm. That's probably quite a cool, uh, would be a cool poster, mm -hmm. actually. I think. Oh, here we go. Okay. So this is an article from AmericanCivilWar.com about Frederick Douglass and it says that Frederick Douglass saw the Civil War as the inevitable consequences of man's inhumanity to man and a necessary conflagration to break the bonds of slavery. 
And in the March issue of Douglas Monthly, Monthly, he issued a well-known challenge, Men of Color to Arms, and he recruited over 100 free Blacks from upstate New York for the 54th Massachusetts Regiment. And among the recruits arriving at boot camp were two of Douglas's sons, Lewis and Charles. Mm -hmm. So he was apparently active in recruiting Black soldiers to fight in the Civil War, must be the connection mm -hmm. there. Although he was not a, in a, a Buffalo soldier himself. Sounds like the sons were maybe. Yeah, it sounds like he recruited mm -hmm. a couple of his sons up in Massachusetts. Right. Okay. Very good. That's cool. Mm -hmm. Oh, let's hope he didn't lose e either of those sons I know. during any of the conflicts. Let's see if there's more about it. Let's see. His older son served as the first sergeant major of the 54th and was in the thick of the fighting at Fort Wagner, where over a thousand, over 1,500 actually, Union troops were mowed down. Um, let's see. Lincoln sought Douglas's advice and invited him to the White House. Apparently, the two men came to an immediate understanding and respect for one another. He left mm. that meeting feeling that his concerns would be addressed and agreed to continue to do more recruiting. Mm -hmm. I don't see anything else about the fate of his sons. Let's see here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't see anything else from this okay. particular page. Okay, all righty, well, shall but we But that's something on? definitely to look into more mm -hmm. <laughs> another time. Um, well, yeah, I, it's uh, interesting. Yeah. Sure, there's a whole really rabbit hole some... there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> another exhibit they have going on is Vietnam. And it says, we honor African-American soldiers with displays of bravery, such as medals and patches. Also included mm -hmm. are various maps and photographs from the conflict. And the exhibit that I can see that they are representing for their Vietnam exhibit here is a full from the waist up uniform of a Vietnam soldier. And it is in that army fatigue sort of olive green color. And it looks very durable. It has big pockets over the breast where you can store things above the right hand pocket is the soldier's name patch. And above the left hand pocket is there it looks like regiment patches. And this one is wearing a helmet. I can't really see what kind of helmet. I can only see the bottom part of it. It appears to buckle under his chin. And this mm -hmm. definitely looks to be more of like a rugged kind of uniform for going out and actually doing operations in the jungles there. Mm -hmm. Another exhibit they have going on is called Artillery. It says, view the weaponry and munitions used by the African-American soldier, including rifles, muskets, and cannonballs pulled directly from battlefields. And the artifact they have here is some sort of handgun and it's clip. And I'm not really a gun person, so I don't know what era it's from or anything, but it doesn't <laughs> appear to have, like, mm -hmm. it, it looks older to me, like probably more of like a World Wars era kind of gun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I have no idea what a musket is versus a, a rifle. So <laughs> do, is that something that's easily described in to help people to yeah, kind of a visualize. Musket, typically, a musket takes powder rather than bullets. Ah. And so you would have a little place at the back of the musket where there's, they call it the pan, and you'll put your powder in the pan, hence the expression, keep your powder dry. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, it, don't even ask. I grew up uh, around uh, recreation or uh, re what are they called? Reenactment people. Uh -huh. um, oh, yeah, okay. yeah. And mm -hmm. they did a lot of Revolutionary War stuff with muskets mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. flintlock muskets and things like that. So you and for put, muskets, you have to load the ball into the barrel, yep, right? And yep, stuff yeah, down. to load the ball into the barrel, tamp it down. So, you know, mm -hmm. all of everything is is enclosed in a rifle and all you're right. doing is putting the bullets in. And mm -hmm. the musket, you've got this long rod that you push it down in with and all kinds of things. So Yeah, uh, I think at one point yeah, I said musket production. earlier when I meant rifle. I don't think they were saying muskets in Civil War. Actually, they might have been they might in some have been. places. I can find out, actually. Especially mm -hmm. toward the end, because they were getting really low on, on guns and things toward the end. And so it was like mm -hmm. anybody was making guns for the government and things yeah. like that. It was quite chaotic. And... Well, uh, if you yeah. had your Colt 45, I'm thinking you had a rifle in there because I, I know in one description, Julia, you mentioned the Colt 45. Yeah, that, mm -hmm. that one also said they carried a rifle. This looks like muskets mostly were phased out in the mid 1800s with the invention mm -hmm. of reliable yep. rifles, but it wasn't yep. that long before the Civil War. I'm mm -hmm. seeing um, oh, no. 
the first reliable repeating rifle was invented in 1854. Yep, I was so going to say that was just in the 1850s. Been phased out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 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 You want to learn a lot about this kind of stuff? Um, go and watch Pawn Stars. <laughs> 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 you will learn more about guns than you ever wanted to know. And you did say pawn stars. Yes, pawn. <laughs> P-A-W-N. <laughs> yes. It's a little yes. afternoon after museum humor. <laughs> oh, exactly. Exactly. So, yeah. But, um, and actually, I believe they did have um, a Buffalo Soldier sword on there once. Mm-hmm. And they identified the, the crest and all that kind of thing oh, on oh. it. And it was authentic. And I mean, these things, if you can find them, are worth serious money. So, I'm yeah. Sure. <laughs> you know, Janine, you reminded me of something that I had learned when I was reviewing the site earlier. Um, and that is that the Buffalo Soldier Museum also does reenactment. And so for um, anybody out there who's listening in today and uh, watching the show, if you ever have a chance to go to Houston and visit the museum, you may um, inqu- you might, might want to inquire about a reenactment. Yeah, um, you could actually get to feel some of the, the recreated because yeah reenactors will go to extreme lengths mm-hmm. to actually get original kinds of materials to the wool and the uniforms the mm-hmm. you know um all kinds of things so yeah mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. one of our guys actually made his own coonskin cap so wow. <laughs> wow. Okay. yeah that was dedication <laughs> <laughs> wow <laughs> yeah yeah okay. And there's a bit of information here about the reenactment program with a couple after bio, bios, if you're interested in Ooh, that. Yeah, let's let's hear, hear about these people. This okay, so this is like a brief little blurb, but I'll let you hear it. It says, uh, reenactment program, the Buffalo Soldiers National Museum is proud to present these very talented, informative actors and the experiences that they take their audience on. Taking them down the paths of Harriet Tubman and authentic Buffalo Soldiers, they're able to capture the viewer's attention with their expert storytelling skills. Make a reservation for one of our reenactors today, or ask for membership and tours, ask at membership and tours for more information. And so there's two mm-hmm. bios here. The first one is for a man named Wayne DeHart, D-E-H-A-R-T. And there's a photograph of him here. He's wearing that dark blue shirt that we talked about earlier with bright yellow suspenders. He has a yellow neckerchief on and that big wide brimmed hat. And this one is in, it looks like a light gray to light brown color. And that's the outfit I remember, the bright mm. yellow. Thank <laughs> yeah, you. Yeah, they've got bright, thinking, bright yellow accessories. Yeah, okay. And this is a probably in his 50s or 60s African-American man with, he has a gray goatee and uh, green salt and pepper hair on the side. And on his face, he has like a very serious, very committed uh, expression on his face. And he appears to be hollering something to the fellow reenactors mm-hmm. in the photograph. Mm-hmm. And it says, Wayne performs a soldier's story, a reenactment of the story of a Buffalo soldier. He has been a mainstay in the Houston theater scene for more than 25 years. Mr. Jehart's career spans more than 100 stage productions. He has appeared in such films as RoboCop 2, A Perfect World, and Looper, and such television programs as Walker, Texas Ranger, Prison Bake, and Breaking Bad. So they've got real actors doing this. Mm -hmm. And then the other man that they have a bio here for is named James Faulkner. And the photograph of him is he is standing in a similar outfit to Mr. or uniform as Mr. DeHart above, but he is standing in a salute pose and you can see his bright yellow glove on his right hand as he's saluting at his cap. And you can also see in this photograph that below that darker blue shirt, he's wearing khaki colored slacks with a yellow stripe down the side. And this is a very stoic photograph of him saluting in the dark. And for his bio, it says, James is a writer, director, actor, and educator. He often performs the life of a Buffalo soldier for the museum's patrons. His desire is produce, create, and present positive imagery of the Black experience in the U.S. And he is currently working on a screenplay about about the 10th Cavalry. Mm -hmm. So that's neat. Okay, good. And then it looks like right now they also have World War I and World War II exhibits, which is, of oh, course, about wow. the role of Buffalo soldiers in the World Wars and in the Boxer yeah. Rebellion. Mm-hmm. Let's it says they have communication devices and helmets from those wars. And then there's mm-hmm. something really cool called the Tech Wall. 
Ooh. Which Ooh. is oh, it we says, gotta go tech wall. Oh, that's <laughs> right. I was gonna say Ira any bank. Ira go has to go wall. to the tech. <laughs> the robot's getting excited now. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. This is tech from a little bit before the robot's time, but it says <laughs> this wall contains a variety of farming and hand tools, household appliances, health and health and beauty items with items spanning generations. This is a tangible look into the past. And I don't have an item by item view of this wall or anything, but from what I can see, I can give you a bit of an idea of the things that they have. Cool. Okay. So um, on the left side of this wall here, I see, as they said, a variety of farming implements. I can see a yoke for, it looks like some sort of plow animal. And then some different kinds of vices. I see some irons, like clothing irons, mm -hmm. um, a variety of hanging lanterns that are all rusted out, but they still have their glass intact and all that kind of mm -hmm. cool detail. I see some cast iron pots, one of which has different divisions in it, like for cooking cornbread or something like that on the stove. Oh. Mm. Uh, let's see what else is on here. Some oil cans, some smaller tools. I see some calipers. Uh, old tin cans and glass bottles. And so this is the kind of thing that you could spend, you know, yeah. oh my a gosh. long time yes. looking at and learning about all the different. And, yes. and look at what they consider tech, because of course that's right. where they were at the time, you know, irons and cast iron um, pots and pans and things like that. You know, that's um, interesting. Um, but just being able to make some of those things, mm -hmm. you know, when they mm -hmm. need them in the field. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not having exactly. to do everything by hand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. So that is the exhibits page, what they have to offer at the museum in Houston at the moment. They also, mm -hmm. on this website, have a blog section that has a few different little uh, blog posts about different Ooh. topics related to this museum. So let's see. Yeah, let's, let's hear that. Okay, so this one seems most relevant from what I've seen so far. It's called Salute a Soldier about someone called Doris Miller. And this was published in November of 2020 and appears to be from oh. Navy Times. Oh, okay. great. And so this has a really nice photograph right up top. And this is a photo. Let me see if I can find out when it's from first. Let's see. So he enlisted in the U.S. Neighbor, Navy, sorry, the U.S. Navy on <laughs> September 16th, 1939. So this is from the 40s, this photograph would be, early 40s. And it's a photograph of Mr. Miller, who is a Black, uh, black Navy man, and he's standing aboard, I'm sort of making assumptions, but he's standing and you can see the sky behind him. You can't see where he's standing exactly, but you can see wide open sky behind him. This is a black and white photograph. And he's standing in his navy whites with a cap on his head. And he's looking not at the camera, but out beyond the camera, like he's looking at the horizon. And he's got uh, that navy tie around his neck and a medal on his left breast. And I'm going to try to find out what that medal is for you, because I think that's what this blog post mm -hmm. is about. So it says, in this edition of Salute a Soldier, we salute Doris Miller, an American sailor who made major contributions during the attacks on Pearl Harbor. He was born in October 12, 1919 in Waco, Texas. And before Pearl Harbor, Miller enlisted in the US Navy on September 16th, 1939 as a mess attendant third class, a position that was given to few African-Americans. Mm -hmm. He was first assigned to an ammunition ship called Pyro, but later transferred to West Virginia on January 2nd, 1940. On the ship, he would start boxing, becoming the ship's heavyweight champion. He would rise to the position of mess attendant second class in 1941. On, September, on December 7, 1941, the Japanese would attack the naval base Pearl Harbor. Miller was on duty collecting laundry on the lower deck of the USS West Virginia when the alarm ordered crew members to their battle stations. Miller would see that his station was destroyed by a Japanese torpedo. Miller would start carrying wounded men to safety, including Captain Mervyn Benison, the ship's commander. Miller then started shooting at enemy planes with a 50 caliber, caliber anti-aircraft anti gun. He was not trained to operate this weapon, which is used for aerial attack. His valor would earn him the Navy Cross, which is the, the medal that he had on him up above, mm -hmm. which is the mm -hmm. second highest decoration after the Medal of Honor. After the attacks, a hero in his own right, Miller would become the face of recruiting African Americans to enlist in the Navy. Miller would continue to serve until his death at the Battle of Macon on November 20th, 1943, where his ship was struck by a Japanese submarine and would sink, killing 628 crew members out of 900, and he was 24 mm. years old. 
Oh my, he did all. Oh, that. All oh, that. wow. And his name again, Julia, is it? I thought I heard Doris. Mm -hmm. Doris, D O R I S Miller. Oh, Doris. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's only one word. Okay. Mm -hmm. Interesting for those wow. who might want to look him up um, during this month and uh, yeah. especially Black History Month. You know, you don't get another story we don't know about in terms of learning history. Exactly. Learning and I had not heard that history. one before. When I yeah. heard West Virginia, I thought, oh, no, oh, no, because that mm -hmm. ship went down big time. Mm -hmm. Woo, mm -hmm. It's I believe it's next to the Arizona, I think, or mm -hmm. at least parts of it are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, 24. Jeez. And yeah, that's then, sort of just a look at how the continuation of, you know, Black recruiting into the military and Black contributions that you don't necessarily always hear about. Again, yeah. Yeah, again. all the and way into so, World War II and probably mm -hmm. today. And, you know, I, I'm wondering, uh, the Navy Cross, is it actually, I don't want to say just a cross, but is it a, a cross with any kind of special insignia on it? Or what does that look like? I had a good photo of it. Okay, so the Navy Cross is a cross that is even on all four sides. And it appears to be made of a gold colored metal. Let me see if I can find out if it's actually gold or what. You know, we should actually get some of our IRA uh, agents who are veterans on here and uh, talk one day about different metals and insignia and what yeah, do the various uh, emblems of the armed forces mm -hmm. look like that would be kind of interesting because awesome. I, mm -hmm. I vaguely remember some of them from what I could see but um, I mm -hmm. don't remember them all and I mm -hmm. know that the Coast Guard one when I was involved with the auxiliary it's pretty involved <laughs> it's a very mm -hmm. involved I, insignia I would imagine. yeah <laughs> yeah yeah and they all have each branch uh, of the military, I'm sure, has its special um, medals and pins and, and different things. Um, I've always wondered, you know, what when that when they dress and they have their various medals um, to add to their uniforms, it was there an order for them? I mean, certain things go certain places. Oh, um, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. It's, it's extremely specific on what goes where. And there mm -hmm. is a whole um, a whole guide to basically putting on all of your medals and mm -hmm. your ribbons and things like that. And when mm -hmm. you can wear which ribbons and uh, mm -hmm. even for the auxiliary, because we got basically very similar awards, including duty uh, patches and things like that if you okay. went out on assignment with the Coast mm -hmm. Guard, which didn't happen too often, but it, it did mm -hmm. happen. We didn't get to go on any assignments when we were in, but, you know, it was always something that you could definitely volunteer for. And yeah, yeah. yeah, and there was always, you know, okay, if you're gonna do this, please get your uniform right. And of course we <laughs> had to buy our uniform, so. <laughs> right, right. But yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah, that's a that's a very interesting kind of um, adventure for folks, and I know there are a number of people around the country that are involved in the Coast Guard Auxiliary who are blind. So, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, there's definitely some opportunities there. Okay, I found some more information about the Navy Cross. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so it is. It's been made of some different things over the years. It looks like, but. In different areas, you can actually tell them apart because some of them have a more anodized finish, which is apparently mm -hmm. how you control the thickness of the natural oxide le level on the surface of the metal parts. <laughs> so, yeah. But in general, it's a bronze cross and there are four laurel leaves at the intersection of each of the arms of the cross. And then mm -hmm. in the center of the cross is a sailing vessel. And it says that the vessel is a symbolic caravel of the type used between 1480 and 1500. 1500 the designer Fraser mm -hmm. selected the caravel because it was a symbol often used by the Naval Academy and because it represented both naval surface and the tradition of the sea. So it's like a big sailing vessel. Mm -hmm. And then the Navy Cross is always hung from a blue, 
uh, what is it called? I'm trying to find the right word. Ribbon, sorry, mm -hmm. <laughs> navy blue ribbon, of course, <laughs> with a white stripe down the center. And apparently that white stripe has changed sizes over the years, which is another way you can tell which era it is from. But so it's a mm -hmm. navy blue ribbon with a white stripe down to the center and then the mm -hmm. bronze cross hanging below. And it's wow. quite intricate and pretty. Yeah, I love the visual um, of that, Julia. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And it makes me also wonder if this museum has a gift shop. It does. And if so, because you know, that's where we end. end up yep. gift shop. You got uh, it, I was going to say. mugs and <laughs> crosses and all kinds of things that would be of interest, especially for anyone shopping for um, a loved one, spouse, or significant other. Um, who might be a veteran and um, want to get them something, um, you know, unique. Uh, I'm not known as the most um, innovative gift giver. So <laughs> I'm kids, for myself. grandkids. <laughs> exactly. Um. Yeah. We were kind of psyched when we found out that the Tuskegee Airmen had an action figure. Can you imagine the Buffalo Soldiers mm -hmm. action figure? How cool would that be? That would be way that would be cool. cool. Especially if they had the horse with it, too. Mm -hmm. I would have been right mm -hmm. there as a kid. The patch <laughs> is very interesting. I, I love a, a tactile version of the patch. That would be. Oh, yeah. Let me see what they have like that. They do seem to have a lot of, they have pins and keychains. I can see right off the bat with. Okay. Those kinds of things, the insignias from different uh, regiments. So there's a mm -hmm. 9th Cavalry pin. I see it's a little enamel pin with their uh, patch insignia. And then there's some things with the um, insignia of the museum. There's a leather keychain mm -hmm. with that. Uh, let me see if I can find anything else kind of in that vein. They have a lot of... Um, Apparel, a lot of t-shirts, a lot of hoodies, a lot of ball cap style hats mm -hmm. with all kinds of different designs. They also appear to have some Tuskegee Airmen oh, merchandise. Yeah, oh, wow. Ah. You can get your one stop shopping in there. Some really I cool was going to say. Yeah. yeah uh -huh. <laughs> it's also like pretty simple, just Buffalo Soldiers designs, which are nice. There's one that says Buffalo Soldiers in yellow with cross sabers between the two words, which mm -hmm. is neat looking. Mm -hmm. They also have a lot of books in this bookshop. If you're interested in learning more about the history mm -hmm. of the Buffalo Soldiers, or it looks like also other things that were going on in the nation at the time of the Buffalo mm -hmm. Soldiers is an Underground Railroad book. There is a Harriet Tubman Freedom Leader book. Um, here's one yeah. called Buffalo Soldiers and Officers of the Ninth Cavalry, the Buffalo mm -hmm. Soldier Tragedy of 1877. So a nice, like, healthy breadth of different topics and mm -hmm. books mm -hmm. of reading. Is anyone? Well, thinking? I am curious too, mm -hmm. as we um, get near the top of the hour, if there is any one Buffalo Soldier that was um, a standout, historically speaking. Um, anybody that, uh, other than the young person that we just heard about, uh, is there anyone that stands out, especially back in the 1800s, 18, I think 76, 77 era? Let's see, I found something. Let me see if this fits what you're asking. So this is an article from Arizona Central and it's called the Buffalo Soldiers of Fort Huachuca, Huachuca, H-U-A-C-H-U-C-A, yep. <laughs> Huachuca, African-American okay. soldiers in the West. And so this is, this article starts with a little overview of who the Buffalo soldiers were, a bit of the mm -hmm. stuff that we just covered. Right. But I saw in the preview of this article something about a standout general. Where did he go? This is about Buffalo Soldier. Here he is. He's a colonel, Colonel Charles Young at Fort Huachuca. He was an incubator of sorts for some prominent, or sorry, Fort Huachuca was an incubator of sorts for some prominent people, African American and otherwise, in the military. One standout figure during the Buffalo Soldier's time at Fort Huachuca was Colonel Charles Young. Born in 1864 to parents who had been enslaved, Young enrolled at the United States Military Academy and became just the third African American West Point graduate. 
He enrolled in the academy at the encouragement of his father, who had escaped slavery and served in the army during the Civil War. Young graduated in 1889, but had to wait three months for his first assignment, as the army did not allow Black officers to command white troops. He was initially assigned to the 10th Cavalry, which was stationed in Nebraska before the move to Fort Huachuca. He also served in the 9th Cavalry and the 25th Infantry, as well as the 9th Ohio Volunteer Infantry during the Spanish-American War. During the search for Pancho Villa in 1916, Young, who was at the time a major, led his troops at a charge against Villa's forces at Aguas Calientes, Mexico, and suffered no losses. He also led his troops to successfully relieve a 13th Cavalry unit that had been pinned down by Mexican government troops. His actions at that time are believed by some historians to have prevented a larger war between the U.S. and Mexico, and he was promoted to lieutenant, lieutenant colonel for his efforts. In 1917, he was promoted to colonel and served briefly as commander of Fort Huachuca. Unfortunately, later that year, he was forced to retire with a diagnosis of high blood pressure. Mm. So that's one that wow. is, you know, from a dad who was a slave all the way to preventing mm -hmm. a worse war. Right. That's and a lieutenant colonel. Amazing. Yeah. And, it, and it's hard to believe. I mean, 1916 was Pancho Villa. I, I always think of wow. that as being like in the 1850s or something. I'm like, no, so it too. was no. it was pretty recent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, a uh, 100 years recent. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but not certainly not in the 1800s. Like I thought I don't, because I don't know my history very well. Um, my regular U.S. history, but um, yeah. yeah, this is just amazing. This is so what I enjoy about these museums and particularly the ones with um, the African-American museums that we've covered is just this untold history, you know, and every one we cover, I'm sure there's, for everything we uncover, there's a thousand more that we didn't cover. So, yeah. you know, oh, people absolutely. are encouraged to explorers Absolutely. especially yeah get with an agent and go and do some of these um, you got to check this one out yeah, it is yeah. um buffalo soldier museum.com and there's no s mm -hmm. on soldiers there so it's buffalo soldier museum.com they are in houston and julia are they open right now right i want to say no hold on there's something yeah. at the bottom Okay. So this has reopening procedures. Let's see what that says. Oh, great. Okay, so they are open. They're open 10 oh. a.m. to 4 p.m. Tuesday oh, to Saturday right now. Oh, They're right. open at 50% capacity. Yep. I was going to mm -hmm. say definitely call ahead, mm -hmm. but um, mm -hmm. absolutely, if you're in the Houston area, please pay them a visit and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, um, let them know that you, you heard about them here on Afternoon right. at the Museum. Now, yeah. next week... We, oh, we have a hand raised out there. You know what? We can take a minute. Let me get to my, get over here. All righty. Okay. Oh, I got to find my, my hand raised. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's going to take me a second here. Sorry. I'm just trying to find my find my hand raised person and I'm sorry I can't find you right now but and we're almost out of time however the one thing I did want to tell everybody about our schedule next week we are going to travel around the globe and we are going to hear about the aborigines of Australia and the reason we're going to hear about the aborigines is that in Australian culture often aborigines are called black and they Believe me, it's sort of the worst of both, you know, being an indigenous people and there wasn't slavery in Australia, but there was a whole lot of discrimination and mm -hmm. continues to be some issues. Now, Caleb, one of our other Afternoon at the Museum agents, has a particular interest in the Aborigines of Australia, and we are going to have some fun. So we are going to take a look at their history, their culture, and and here is a gentleman who is familiar to at least one of our panelists. Hello, Mr. Watts. How are you? And let's see if I can give him permission to talk. Yeah, there we go. Okay, let me, there we go. I'll ask you to unmute. There we go. 
Okay. Probably have to and tap on our mute button. Yeah. yeah. Yep. This is my there this we... is my question. Yes, sir. We're during you know the Buffalo Soldiers has been an, an outstanding hour. Were there any women involved in, in their service as well, other than the soldiers? Oh, good question. I bet not, but Julia will uh, Julia will scoot over there and take a look. That is a great question. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. I'm and while she on is a, on looking for line. that, probably yeah. I would but, guess probably, you yeah. know, the standard I found uh, something. Say, Camp followers, yeah. but <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. why is it Janine's always going to the bad places in this episode? <laughs> I found I found something about a female buffalo oh. soldier. <gasps> Sweet. Oh, okay. All yeah. right. Uh, this is on the Wounded Warrior Project website. There's a whole long article, <gasps> but it's called Cathay yes. or maybe Kathy C H T H A Y Williams defied her time to become the only known female buffalo soldier. Oh wow! Mm. Awesome. Good awesome. question. Now, here oh, she question. served for real. Like she was in the 38th U.S. Infantry. Oh, wow. There's a picture, uh, illustration of her here wearing the uniform with the rifle and the saber and everything. So oh, that's wow. something oh, to look into really for sure. Serve. Oh, okay. that is awesome. Boy, wow. Somebody can write a good book report and get credit for, for <laughs> who, who? something. So there you go. Finding that look, one up, look up those female. You got mm -hmm. it, those female Buffalo soldiers. And there you go. You got the one. And you heard it here. <laughs> right. Well, as I said, <laughs> yeah, thank you. Next week, we will be talking about Australia. The week after that, this is going to be an interesting one because it will not be visual. We'll be on YouTube. But we're going to have the blind history lady here, Peggy Chung. And she is going to be talking about blind Americans who were also black or of other minorities. and we are going to learn about some people that you have probably never heard of before, but who really made some significant contributions. And the Blind History Lady website is fascinating. If you ever want to know anything about uh, where we have been in the blind community, notable people, etc., we're going to find out from Peggy. And then on the 26th, we are going to have a little bit of a different session. We're going to be talking with a panel, and we're putting together the panel now, but it's about visual interpretation and minority communities and how people of color you know, work with visual interpreters and some interesting issues that I know I had never thought of until I started talking to people and hearing what their experiences were. So mm -hmm. stick around for more details on that one. Um, somebody in this audience, though, is going to be in Washington, D.C. Well, by Zoom anyway. Sort of. Sort of. Sort of. Yeah. Sort of. <laughs> uh, doing that wonderful legislative work for the American Council of the Blind that week is uh, mm -hmm. legislative week for them. And uh, so I'm sure you will tell us all about that when you get back, right? Yes. Yes, awesome. I will. I, it's actually um, virtual um, at some point. I hope to have an opportunity to uh, actually go to Washington, D.C. But of course, you know, with a pandemic uh, still in full effect. We're not doing that travel, but um, I'm looking forward to the experience of talking to the legislators and learning um, about advocacy from a different perspective. And yeah, I want to be happy to share um, uh, over the rest of the year as, you know, as it fits in with mm -hmm. everything else we're doing. Awesome. So, yeah. Well, we have something political coming up on the 19th of March. We will have the Presidential Pets Museum. Oh, Ooh. boy. Ooh. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> wants that one. All the agents want to do that one. And we will have one of the uh, curators from the Presidential Pets Museum, who is also a visually impaired guide dog user. So how Ooh. fun is that going to be? That's going to be very fun. And he's going to talk about his career and all about the museum. And then we'll look at all of the presidential pets, including an alligator and a raccoon. Ooh, Yay. alligator. <laughs> <laughs> I know. That's what I was thinking. I, you know, and that oh, was not oh the boy. past administration. So we're not even going there. <laughs> I, you know, I might as well wrap this up with a great bomb right there and just go, you know. <laughs> Well, Thanks, I want to thank everybody <laughs> for tuning in. We will see you next week here with Afternoon at the Museum. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye.
Thank you, Julia. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Pleasure as always. Thank you, Janine.